<laughs> done. <laughs> Last time we forgot. And if it's okay, Wob, it's Thank just you. so that some kids are away and then they they read the book and it they they were so disappointed um, that they didn't see it and something happened with the server and I don't know, technology, right? Sure. So um, can you please remind us as if this the group has already spoken to Wob? We no. did it. No. This is a first time crew. Okay, there we go. So um, that's really good information. So students, I am really, really proud to introduce you to an amazing writer, um, a journalist. Um, I hear him on CBC sometimes. I listen to him over the holidays because I didn't want to listen to Christmas music all the time. So sometimes I heard even Wob pop in and talk about talking. <laughs> it was really cool to hear a voice that I've um, grown to know. And uh, he wrote a book that we had lots of copies sent out to school called Moon of the Crusted Snow. And <laughs> you have a lot of questions prepared for him. Plus, he's going to tell you a little bit about being a writer and the background. Now, the only sort of caveat is I need to be off the call at 10 15 because I have another class starting at that time but an hour is certainly a long time and we get to talk to him again on Thursday so it's all okay. it's all fantastic <laughs> okay so I'm going to turn it over to Wob these are the students is this grade 9 or 10 10 10 so yeah yeah you do look more mature than the grade nines <laughs> over to you Wob Hi. Uh, I'm Wab Gija Gray. You can call me Wab for short if you like. I'm originally from Wasoxing First Nation, which is on Georgian Bay, right beside Perry Sound, Ontario. A couple hours north of Toronto. And uh, I'm a member of the Bear Clan up in Nishnabe. And right now I live in Sudbury, Ontario, which is a uh, little farther north from where I grew up. And I live here with my wife and my two sons. Our older son, Jequis, is four, and our little guy, Yabes, he's just a baby. He's just seven years old. And uh, I'm here as well. And for a long time, I worked at CBC, but I recently left CBC so that I could uh, do writing full time. And uh, it's been a very interesting uh, time since I, I left the job back in the spring. Obviously, with the pandemic and everything going on, uh, things have changed, but it's been a pretty exciting time for me because now I can just focus on writing all the time, which is pretty cool. So uh, I know it's been a really tough time for a lot of people during the pandemic. You know, no, no place has escaped it. It's managed to touch pretty much all parts of uh, the land, which is kind of scary, but uh, I mean... Uh, I, I'm always inspired when I see communities uh, everywhere rallying together to make sure that everybody stays safe and healthy. Uh, my home community went into lockdown back in the spring. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had any cases there yet, right? So, you know, hopefully once the vaccine starts rolling, we'll uh, get back to a normal life once again. And uh, maybe I'll be able to come up and visit you guys in sometime. That'd be really cool. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really honored that you've read Moon of the Crescent Snow. That really means a lot to me. And uh, I'm just here today to answer any questions you may have about the book or you may have about uh, being a, an author or being a journalist or being the Shinabe. Uh, You know, what it was like for me to grow up on the res and uh, then move to the city because I moved from the res to Toronto to go to university. And that was a pretty, uh, pretty scary thing. It was a pretty big thing back then, um, but uh, it, it led me to where I am today. So I'll just tell you a little bit about where I grew up and, and how I became a, a writer. Uh, so my home reserve of Wasoxing is on an island on Georgian Bay. And there's only about, I think, 400 people that live on reserve. And uh, it's got a, a wider membership of about 1,000 people, though. So people who live in Perry Sound or Sudbury or Barrie or Toronto and so on. Uh, my mom is from the town of Perry Sound, and my dad is from the Res, so I'm of mixed heritage, both the uh, settler and the Shinabe heritage. And uh, uh, to me, that's been, you know, pretty um, awesome to grow up with both of those uh, backgrounds uh, and that understanding of my background and heritage, you know. Uh, so when um, 
I was born. Uh, my parents, they were both actually living in Ottawa, but they decided they wanted to start a family back on the res because they wanted to raise their kids in the community with the culture. And uh, so they moved back to the res before I was born. And uh, that's where I grew up. So I was born in 1979. I'm 41 years old. Uh, gonna turn 42, holy. Um, but when I grew up back in the 1980s, it was a pretty cool time in our community because um, it was uh, sort of a, a bit of a renaissance, I guess you'd call it. You know, people were really reconnecting with uh, Anishinaabe traditions, uh, like, you know, having powwows and having ceremonies like sweat lodges and, and that kind of thing. So for me, I grew up in a time when people were really proud to be Anishinaabe, uh, when they were really looking at ways to bring culture back into the community. And um, I, I benefited from that greatly, you know. I got to hear the old stories. I got to learn a lot of history. I didn't really learn my language fluently, unfortunately. You know, I, I heard a lot of my language growing up, but it, you know, just, I, I didn't learn it properly for a number of reasons, right? But, you know, I'm trying now to, to learn it fluently now that I have kids. So um, growing up in the age was a really cool time. Uh, and I guess some of my earliest memories are like going to powwows and dancing and, and drumming and so on. And, and I think that really uh, set a foundation for me to become passionate about stories and storytelling. Uh, because in our culture, and I think it's the same with your culture, um, our history is passed down from generation to generation by telling stories, right? You know, the elders will tell the young people um, about how things came to be or where we come from and so on. And I was always really interested in that. I thought it was really cool because in our school on the res, you know, we would have elders come in pretty regularly to share stories with us. Uh, you know, we would uh, stop class whenever an elder decided to pop in and, and just hang out with us, right? It was really cool. So those are some of my earliest memories too. And, and I think that's how I understood the world is through stories. Um, it became clear to me that creating a community and keeping people together was by talking, by sitting around together and sharing in a circle. Kind of like how we're doing today, uh, although like through the internet, right? <laughs> um, but that was always really important to me. And as I grew up and went off to high school, you know, I, I was still really interested in stories. But when I went to high school, it was off the resort. It was in town. And it became a little different. And I was sort of um, became more aware of the differences in storytelling and the differences in culture, uh, specifically like in the school system too. So whereas at school on the res, we would make time to sit around and listen to our elders. When I went to high school, there was nothing really like that, right? And when we studied stories, uh, we'd all just be reading books. You know, we wouldn't be talking about the stories together. So I just thought, okay, that's just a different way of doing things. You know, that, that's the way they do it in town. And on the res, we do it a different way. Um, and when I was reading books, I was like, oh, you know, there's not really any Indigenous characters or Indigenous stories in any, in any of these books. So I guess that's not the place for our stories or for our people. And this is back in the 1990s, right, when I was in high school, when I was your age. And I just sort of accepted that. I just sort of thought that's the way it was. And, and it's, you know, looking back, it's really sad to realize that, you know, there were actually a lot of great Indigenous authors at the time who were writing important books. But that wasn't being shared with us through the school system. You know, the, the mainstream school system prioritized Indigenous voices, and we didn't learn about them, you know? And, you know, that's really uh, unfortunate to, to consider. But now things are different, fortunately. You know, a lot of kids everywhere are reading a lot about Indigenous uh, stories and Indigenous experiences through books uh, by Indigenous authors, which is really awesome. Um, so reading books really uh, piqued a new interest in me, and, and it really showed me how there are different ways of presenting stories. But again, I didn't think that was a place for me or for my community because I hadn't seen Indigenous authors in that area before. Fortunately, I had an auntie who was my original teacher on the res school. Uh, she uh, asked me one day, she said, uh, when I was probably grade, grade 10, probably your age, she said, oh, hey, Wab, what's your, uh, what's your favorite class in school? And I said, well, it's, it's English class. She said, oh, yeah, why? And I said, well, you know, I, I really like reading books and I really like creative writing. You know, I like our assignments where we get to be creative. Uh, it's really fun. And she was like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And she said, well, what's, what books are you, are you reading? Who are the authors that you're reading? I was like, oh, you know, like Shakespeare and 
W.O. Mitchell, J.D. Salinger, uh, basically all, like, old white guys, right? And she was just like, okay, you know, like, that's interesting. And she kind of just, like, like, left the conversation there. And I was like, okay, you know, my auntie, she just wanted to, wanted to know how it was going kind of thing. But after that, I started getting presents from her uh, on my birthday or at Christmas uh, of books by Indigenous authors. You know, people like Thomas King and Richard Wagamese and Lee Miracle, Louise Erdrich, uh, all these authors who were doing really important books back in the 1990s. And like totally blew my mind. I was like, holy geez, there are Indigenous authors writing books about Indigenous people. You know, I never realized that that was actually happening before. Uh, so it totally changed my world. And I was like, okay, finally, I see, you know, stories like mine in books. And that sort of validated my own experiences and uh, my own community's experiences. This is awesome. This is cool. And that inspired me to write more. Uh, I started writing, you know, just as a hobby, just as a creative outlet. I'd go home from school and sit in my room on the rest and just like write out stories on a notepad just for fun, you know? Um, and so I thought, you know, it'd be really cool to be an author someday, but I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> you know, I'd, I was like, what do you go to school for to be an author? Or how do you like, you know, get a book published? Uh, that was just not clear to me at all. And I didn't really have anybody in the high school uh, setting, like no teachers or guidance counselors, uh, really encouraging me to do that. So I was like, okay, well, I guess, you know, this will just be a hobby for me from now on. It's not what I'm going to do for, for a living. Um, but what I did end up figuring out was that I was interested in journalism. That was a way to like, to write and to tell stories and to make a living, uh, to make a career out of it, right? So eventually I went, I decided to go to university for journalism. So I moved down to Toronto to go to Ryerson, Ryerson University. Uh, that was way back in 1998 and I graduated in 2002. So, um, I really enjoyed it. It was awesome. It was a cool way of like going out and seeing the world and like writing and sharing other people's stories and so on. And what I did was I, I was a freelance journalist for a little while. And that just means like I, I wrote for various newspapers and magazines and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, got assignments about random things here and there. So I did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then I started working for the Weather Network. I don't know if you guys watch the Weather Network up there, but uh, it's uh, it was based in Mississauga, which is near Toronto. So that's where I started working as a writer for them. So I would write their news breaks. Every half hour, there was a news break on, on the Weather Network. So I would write that. And eventually, I started being a TV reporter for them. They uh, had an opening, and they said, hey, Wob, why don't you try this out? So I was like, yeah, OK, I'll go on TV. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> we'll see what happens. And, and I ended up really liking it. It was fun. Um, so back from there, uh, I, I heard about a job opportunity at CBC in Winnipeg and uh, I applied for it and I ended up getting it. So that's, that's how I started at CBC. I was a TV reporter for a long time, uh, moved from Winnipeg to Ottawa about 10 years ago and uh, worked there for a while and then moved from Ottawa to here Sudbury three years ago because there's another job that came up here. And, and my wife and I really wanted to come to Sudbury because it's close to our community. Uh, her home community is near Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is a little west of here. Um, so yeah, we've been in Sudbury since. Uh, I ended up being the radio host here in Sudbury for the afternoon show for a couple of years. But then uh, my book, uh, my last book, sort of uh, got a lot of attention. And, and I was able to sort of make that transition from journalism to being an author then. So uh, that's Moon of the Crescent Snow. That's the book that, that you're all familiar with. So, so uh, that was my third book. Um, my two earlier books are called Legacy and Midnight Sweat Lodge. And they were published by Thetis Book, which is an indigenous publisher in BC. Um, so when I was writing those books, that was sort of like my, my, uh, my side hustle, I guess you could say, like my side job, you know? Uh, but now I've made being an author my full-time job, which is really awesome. So uh, yeah, that's sort of where I, how I got to where I am today. Um, and uh, I can tell more stories later if, if you guys want me to. But uh, right now, I'll answer any questions that you guys have. Like to be on the Riz. What's that? Sorry? How is it like to be on the Riz? Oh, on the Riz. It's really cool. Oh, is that a Leafs hat you have on, too? <laughs> oh, hat is what it is. I'm pretty stoked for next week. It's going to be awesome. Uh, being on the res is pretty cool. Um, 
and and I think like the, all, all resins are different, right? Uh, but where I'm from, a lot of the resins are are pretty similar, and uh, it's in the Nishnabe territory, right? So if you uh, take a look at a map and you look at the Great Lakes, basically all around the Great Lakes is Nishnabe territory. So the Nishnabe are our ancestors lived around the Great Lakes since time immemorial. So a lot of the communities around the Great Lakes are pretty, pretty similar. You know, we have, uh, you know, similar cultures, similar languages, um, similar history, and so on. Uh, and for me, like I had a pretty good idea of our community history from the beginning. And what our people used, used to do was just travel along the North shore of, of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, um, you know, following the food, uh, you know, setting up settlements uh, according to the different seasons and so on, right? But when uh, the treaties were signed, and the treaty that governs our people is called the Robinson Huron Treaty, it was signed in 1850, and that's before Canada became a country, right? It predates Canadian Confederation, which was in 1857. So this is an agreement that's older than the country of Canada itself. But once Canada became established, uh, the government of Canada said, oh, this Robinson Huron Treaty. So that means uh, you Indians got to go there, you Indians got to go there, you Indians got to go there. But the treaties don't really say that, right? So that's just the way Canada interpreted it. So, you know, my people had to go onto this island that we grew up on. So I think it was a really hard transition for them back then. And this was in the late 1800s, right? This is like 120, 130 years ago. Uh, because they couldn't travel anymore and they couldn't like farm food or anything because they're on this island you know an island is just like a big rock essentially right so i think it was really hard for them back then and a lot of bad things happened as a result of that you know um people were uh, really sad you know uh they were angry and um as as other things started happening like as the kids started getting taken away to residential school uh the situation got a lot worse and then the, the Indian Act, uh, I don't know how familiar you all are with the Indian Act, but it, it said, like, you can't do your ceremonies, you can't uh, leave the res without permission, um, all kinds of different restrictions on people in the res, right? So that just made everything worse, too. So um, there were some really uh, rough times in our community for a while, and this was long before I was born, right? So there was, like, a lot of... Um, tragic things that happened, uh, you know, a lot of uh, abuse um, and a lot of uh, just, you know, really dark times, I guess you could say. But after a while, you know, after decades of that happening, <clears throat> the, like my dad's generation, people that age, uh, they decided that they wanted to put an end to all that bad stuff, um, that they wanted to raise uh, their kids, like my generation, in a healthy place. So they made serious efforts to um, reverse sort of the, that cycle and, and really teach people about what happened to us as a people, right? So that's why I grew up like going to powwows and stuff because it was at that time when uh, the older generation said, no, you know, we want our kids to have their culture and we want them to have their language and so on. So it was exciting for me. Like my childhood was really cool. Um, and of course, like it wasn't all great. You know, there were tough things that happened from time to time, you know. Uh, I feel really lucky that, you know, I was, I was able to grow up in like a happy and healthy environment. So, you know, our res, uh, it's right on Georgian Bay. So we do a lot of swimming. Uh, there are a lot of really cool jumping clips on our res. Um, you know, since like, I remember I was jumping off big cliffs into the water, right? So. Um, it, you know, we pretty much swam all the time in the summer. Uh, we played a lot of baseball too. Like baseball was a big thing on our res because we had a, a baseball field right in the middle of the community. Uh, we did a lot of fishing too um, because that's what our people did for a long time around that Georgian Bay area. So, you know, my childhood was, yeah, it was, it was playing baseball, swimming, fishing, uh, going to powwows, going into ceremonies and so on. And uh, we, were, we were right beside the town of Perry Sound too. So there was a hockey arena in Perry Sound and that's where we learned to play hockey and so on. So <clears throat> it was a really cool way to grow up. And, uh, you know, I, I go back there now. Uh, our family has a little cabin that we stay at in the summertime on the res. And uh, that's just really neat. Like all my cousins have little kids now and uh, they're growing up. 
Um, and, and like all, a lot of the kids in our community have Nishabe names now. Like I was born, you know, with a Nishabe name and that was pretty rare back then. But nowadays, a lot of the kids have, have Nishnabe names, which is really cool. So, you know, I've, I've seen the community change over the course of my life uh, for the better. You know, there are good things happening there. So um, I would, you know, I would like to raise my kids in the res, but uh, there are no journalism jobs there when I was younger. So that's why I had to go to the city, right? So, you know, we take them back there pretty often. Um, and, and hopefully, maybe we'll settle back there someday. Uh, it's just really cool. I'm, I'm proud to come from the rest. Any other questions? Do you, uh, Nick? Good question, Alexa. <laughs> Do you eat Bannock? Yeah, I eat Bannock. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know how to make it, though. Last time I tried to make it, make it, it got really hard. And you couldn't even eat it. Like, oh. Teeth if you had chocolate, oh. right? <laughs> so, like, there's a certain trick you got to do. You like, you got to massage it enough, but not too much, or else it gets like really rock hard, you know? So, but yeah, I, I eat it. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Indian tacos? Huh? No, no. Tacos. Indian tacos. Um, basically, uh, what it is, is like it's, it's fried bread, it's like a fried bannock. So, you have like a little. It, I guess it looked like a pizza, right? So like it's a circle and you take like meat sauce and you put it on it. Then you put lettuce and tomato and cheese on it. And uh, you eat it with a knife and fork. It's really good. It's awesome. So if you guys ever come down here, I'll find someone to make it for you, but I'm not gonna be able to make it because you, know, you, you might not be that tasty. <laughs> what does power mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. Like to me, powwow means uh, a celebration. It's like a celebration of culture. And it's an opportunity for everybody to get, get together and just be really happy and just really uh, be proud of, of who we are and, and our culture and so on. And it's, it's cool you bring that up because uh, in our community, uh, we didn't have a powwow for a really, really long time. Um, we had drums in our community, but those either were taken away or they were destroyed or they were hid because it was illegal to have powwows and on reserves back at back in the day the indian agents uh, would uh, find you if you had powwows so back in the indian when I was a kid that's when we started having powwows again so that's some of my earliest memories are of, of doing that of uh you know being proud of who we are as nishnabek and in our culture uh, I'll tell you a really funny story. Um, so when, when my dad and his friends in that generation decided that they wanted to uh, bring the drum back to our community and to have powwows again, uh, they didn't know how to, how to make a drum, right? Because, you know, they didn't learn from their parents. That was sort of knowledge that was lost over time. So they asked the elder from another res close by um, to show them the drum, to show them songs and to teach them how to play on the drum. So he would bring the drum to, to our res, uh, maybe like once, once every couple weeks. And then they would practice singing songs and, and then he would take the drum and go back to his res, right? So there was no drum in our community. So whenever this guy left, this elder, uh, my dad and those guys, they didn't have a way to practice. They didn't have a way to keep the songs going. Um, so they decided, oh, we need a drum but they didn't know how to make one because you know, they didn't, that knowledge wasn't passed down to them. So they're like, okay, uh, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna fix this situation? So they decided that they would go looking for a drum somewhere to, to practice on. So they went to a city called Aurelia, which is a little farther south of, of our res. And they went to a pawn shop there and they found like a big uh, a drum set, you know, like in, you know, for like a rock band or, or something. You know, so there's like a, you know, a big bass drum and then a snare drum and then toms and then cymbals, right? So, you know, that kind of drum set, eh? Uh, but they saw the big bass drum, the one on the floor, and they're like, oh, that looks like a, a good size. Maybe we can practice that on that. So they talked to the pawn shop guy. They're like, yeah, we just want the, the bass drum. How much for that? And he's like, okay, that's kind of weird, uh, but I'll sell it to you anyway, I guess. So they just bought the bass drum from him. So they brought it back to the res and they just turned it on its side. So like the, the side was on the top, right? And that's what they would drum on. So they're like, okay, there's our 
drum, but how, what are we going to use to as drumsticks? You know, they didn't know how to how to make drumsticks either. You know, they didn't know what kind of branches to get from the bush or or whatever. Right. So like, okay, well, let's get uh, tent poles, old tent poles, and old fishing rods. So they cut up old fishing rods and old tent poles, and they got some foam and they just duct tape foam around the end of it, right? So that was the drumsticks. So they had this old big bass drum and like tent poles and drumming on it like that, right? So that's some of my first memories. That's how I learned how to sing uh, powwow songs was on this bass drum with a tent pole, you know, singing like that. So uh, eventually they learned how to make drums and, and my dad makes drums now. He's, uh, he, he's really good at it. And he taught me how to make drums too, which is really awesome. So um, that's sort of what, what can happen, you know, when, when people decide that they want to reclaim or return to culture, um, that they can find ways to do it. And then uh, I guess it's like it, it becomes like a really um, contagious, contagious might not be a good word considering, you know, our time, but, you know, people see that and they become inspired, right? And they want to do those kinds of things on their own too. And uh, that, yeah, that just really influenced a lot of people in our community. And then people started wanting to go to the powwows and we started having one every summer, which is great. We do have one every summer still. It's always on the uh, August long weekend. And uh, it's one of the best times in our community. So yeah, that's what, be, that's what powwow means to me. How many cousins do you have? <laughs> oh geez, so many. <laughs> well, it's probably like, like, you guys probably see it the same way. Like, you know, you have your, your aunties and uncles, which are like your parents' siblings, and all their kids. Those are all your, like your first cousins, right? That's, that's what people usually call it. And then your cousins, um, they have kids, and you just call them your cousins too, right? You don't say second cousin or third cousin or anything. So honestly, like, too many to count. At least... At least a hundred. There are probably at least a hundred people that I call my cousins, you know, who, who I'm related to in, in my community. Um, that's the other cool thing about being from like a close knit community is that you really uh, understand and appreciate uh, family, right? And and what you know family does for you. And um, uh, yeah, so that's that's you know the big families that I come from. And uh, yeah, it's just it's really awesome to have cousins all over the place, you know. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of that. It really makes me happy to know that I have, you know, family everywhere and that I have good relationships with them. So yeah, lots, lots and lots of <laughs> Did your teach you how to hunt? A little bit, yeah. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we mostly hunted deer. Um, like on our island, I told you, like we live on an island, right? Um, it's a pretty big island, though. Like, if you looked on a map, it would be, you'd be able to see it from, uh, like, uh, the big sort of aerial view of, of the Georgian Bay. You could see our island because it's pretty big. Um, so there's lots of deer that live there. So, yeah, when I was a kid, we went out hunting for deer mostly. Um, and there's some moose on the island, but not a whole lot. If you want to hunt moose, you got to go onto the mainland and go look for moose out there. Um, so we did a lot of that. Um, I haven't done it since I was a kid, though. Uh, since I moved to the city, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't make the time for it. Um, I wasn't able to go back home in the fall to, to go hunting with everybody else because I was either working or doing schoolwork. Uh, but what, what we mostly did was fish uh, because we live right on the water, right? Um, you know, we'd either do, you know, fishing, fishing rods or we would set nets because we're allowed to do that, right? We're allowed to set nets and, and net a whole bunch of fish. Uh, so that's what we did more. We, we fished more than we hunted, but um, I want to get back into hunting. You know, I uh, got my gun license recently and uh, got a lot of cousins who do it. So it's just a matter of uh, getting out there with them and actually doing it, right? You guys go hunting? Yeah, <clears throat> we go hunting too. What do you guys hunt for? Well, oh yeah, right on. We hunt, we hunt seals. Polar bear, walrus, walrus, beluga. Oh yeah, that's cool. Do you guys go hunting? Like, would you go hunting now, or is it? Uh, do you do a lot of hunting in the winter still? We go hunting in the season. In the season, eh? <laughs> nice. Yeah, with us, it's mostly just in the fall time, like right before the uh, right before the winter. 
Um, but we fish, we fish all the time. We, we fish any season too. So, uh, it's important though, right? Because it's sort of, uh, really, it connects you with the land. Eh? That, that's what I like about it. Read on. I'm glad to hear that. That's awesome. You guys got, got any other questions? I have a question. What does your name mean in Ojibwe? Oh, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, there's a story behind that too. Um, so my name, Wabagizik, if you translate that directly, it means white sky. So Wab sort of means white. So if I go by my shirt name, Wab, that's like calling me white, which is kind of funny. It's like, hey, white, <laughs> you know? Wabagizik <laughs> <laughs> means sky. So it's Wabagizik, white sky. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a common name. Uh, it's a common last name in parts of Northern Ontario. There are a lot of people from uh, a place called Mississauga First Nation. There are called a lot of people with the last name Wabagizik there. Uh, but it was my great grandfather's name, my grandma's dad. Uh, he was uh, an important leader in our community. And uh, the name Wabagizik, if you, if you, it also has like another meaning, which is uh, the color of the sky before the sun comes up. Because, uh, you know, before the sun comes up, like down here anyways, the sky sort of takes on this sort of white, white appearance. It's like a neutral color before, you know, the yellow sun comes up. So, yeah, I refer to the color of the sky before the sun comes up. But it, again, it was my grandfather's, uh, my great grandfather's name. And the reason I have it <coughs> is um, when my parents, I told you that they were living in Ottawa, and they decided they wanted to move to the res to raise me, right? Before I was born. So when they got to the res, they were like, okay, well, maybe we should give him, uh, or give our, they didn't know if I was going to be a boy or a girl. They said, maybe we should give our baby an Ishnabe name. And uh, they went to my grandma, my dad's mom, and they said, uh, what, what uh, you know, if we want to give uh, our kid a name in Ojibwe, what do you think we should call it? Um, and she's like, well, you know, maybe something like my father's name, uh, because it's, uh, you know, it means a lot to me. This is my grandmother speaking and it means a lot to our family and so on. So, uh, my parents said, yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. So I was born and, uh, from birth, uh, they gave me that name, Wabagizik. And, um, it wasn't uh, that common back then, you know, this is 1979, right? Uh, for kids to have Nishnabe names because it was just part of that. Um, I guess that, uh, that reclamation, you know, that reconnection with culture, you know, um, people would have Nishnabe names, but they wouldn't use them at all. They mostly just use their own names, right? So, uh, from birth, from, you know, my earliest memories of, our, of introducing myself in, in, in my language, it's been really cool because every day it connects me to my language, connects me to my culture, connects me to my family connects me to my community and, and I'm just really proud of that. You know, I'm proud that every time I speak my name, it means something, you know, it has this connection no matter where I am in the world, you know? So that was uh, something that really inspired me from the beginning. And m my two younger brothers have Nishinaabe names too. Uh, my one brother's name is Nusquanaquit, which means red cloud. And my youngest brother's name is Gigons, which means little otter. Uh, so, you know, since when my wife and I uh, thought we were having kids, we wanted to do that too. We wanted to give our kids an Ishnabe name. So what I did, what we did was uh, we took uh, an offering of tobacco of Sema and we gave it to my dad, uh, who's an elder now. And we, we asked him, you know, can you give our children Ishnabe names? And he did that for us. For our older son, he consulted with my grandmother to ask her what uh, the best name would be for our kids. And our older boy, his name is Jequis, which uh, sort of means like big brother or, or older son. And uh, with our second son, who was just born, uh, my grandmother died a couple years ago, so she, she wasn't able to help my dad. But he came up with the name himself. And uh, our little baby's name is Ayabe, which means uh, like buck, which means like male deer. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how those names come about. And it's just, it's just really cool. It always makes me really proud to to speak my name and to be able to uh, carry that on with my own kids and by giving them the Shnabe names too. Why did you make the book? Why did I write the book? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, great, great question. Well, 
Um, it's sort of a long story about how the book came together. But basically, um, I always wanted to write a book about the end of the world and how indigenous people would deal with it. You know, how indigenous people would respond and how they would come together and really create a new future. I always really wanted to write a book like that. And it was sort of inspired uh, a long time ago. Back in 2003, there was this big blackout in a big part of uh, the continent. And I was living in Toronto at the time, but uh, that day I was back home on the res with my brothers because we were house sitting for our dad and stepmom who were away on summer holidays. So, uh, you know, we were there just hanging out, you know, the middle of the day in August and the power went out. And we're like, okay, that's kind of weird because, you know, the power doesn't usually go out just uh, like on a sunny summer day, right? Usually, you know, it's because of a storm or, or something else. Uh, so, like, okay, whatever, it'll just come back on soon, I guess. But it didn't, you know, so it went into the afternoon, like late in the afternoon, and the power was still out. And so we were bored. <laughs> we're like, okay, we got to find something to do. So we got in the car and we drove into town. Uh, so Perry Sound, the town is only about a 10 minute drive away from the res. And we got there and uh, all of the traffic lights were out and all the stores were closed. And we're like, holy geez, uh, power must be out here too. What's going on? So we went and found people that uh, we knew in uh, downtown. Oh, well, yeah, it's this big blackout. I guess they heard on the radio or they heard somehow that uh, there's this big blackout. All the power was out, you know, in cities like Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Boston, New York City, and so on. Like, the power was out everywhere. And nobody knew why. It was the country. So we were like, holy shit, that's kind of scary. Uh, what if this is like a serious event? You know, what if the power is out for a really long time? So we went back to our dad's place on the res and we're like, okay, maybe we should uh, take stock of all the food in here to make sure we have enough food to eat in case we can't get any anymore. So we went through all the cupboards and looked at all the cans and we looked in the fridge and we're like, okay, what's going to go bad once this fridge is, this fridge gets warm. Um, we're like, okay, let's get some water. And we like fill the bathtub and everything. Right. Uh, and then we went back into the bush and we're like, okay, we should probably get some wood in case we need to cook with a fire, you know? So we went like right into survival mode. Uh, and while we were doing that, we started thinking about the people around us on the res who uh, are resourceful and who we could also help with our own, you know, skills and knowledge, right? So it was, it was kind of comforting. It was kind of really cool to be on the res in that moment because we knew that we were, we were safe there. We knew that we were surrounded by people who would be able to cope with the power being out for good. And uh, yeah, and I was thinking like, oh, I'm just glad I'm not in the city right now because it's got to be a little more, um, a little more chaotic, right? So we, we went to bed that night, woke up the next day, and the power was still out. And we're like, okay, this uh, must, must be the big one. This must be really serious. So we got our fishing gear because we thought, okay, this is how we're going to have to get our lunch now. You know, we should save the, all the cans for later. And if we can get our food now, we should get it. So we got our fishing gear together, and we were about to go fishing, and then the power came back on. So, you know, we started finding out about what actually happened. It was this big uh, power outage that started in Ohio, spread like all over the place. Uh, and, you know, it was coming back on. And um, uh, yeah, so things started to slowly return to normal. But that really stayed with me for a really long time. And I went back to Toronto a couple of days later to go back to work. And I started learning about like, what happened in Toronto, like people were lining up to get gas and people were buying up all kinds of stuff in the grocery store because uh, they were panicked, right? The power was out. Uh, and I was like, okay, this, this is clearly a different response than the one we had in our community. And if something really serious happened, um, there would be two very different uh, experiences, whether you're on the res or in the city, right? To uh, a crisis like that. Uh, so yeah, that, that really just stuck with me for a long time. And then a few years later, I read a book by an author named Cormac McCarthy called The Road. And it's a, an end of the world book. It's a post-apocalyptic book about a father and a son who are just sort of trying to escape the chaos of, uh, of the end of the world. And, and they're basically like running away from people who are trying to eat them, right? <laughs> so it's a pretty dark book. It's pretty, pretty scary and, and pretty violent. 
Um, and I wouldn't recommend it to everyone, but I really liked it, you know? Uh, and, and I thought about all the books like that, that I'd be, I'd read throughout my life, you know, books that I read in high school, like Lord of the Flies or, uh, Brave New World or 1984, stories that are about a dystopian future, about a bad future. And I, I thought, you know, like those, those are all fun books to read. They're all really interesting, but they never really talk about fixing things. They never really talk about creating a better future and they never really explore the relationships between people who would want to create a new future. And I thought of, about my experience on the res during the blackout and I was like, well, that's what we did. You know, we wanted to get together with people and we made a plan. Uh, so I wanted to write a book about that. So after reading that book by Cormac McCarthy, I thought, okay, now I want to write a, a story like this. So I sort of thought about it for a few years, um, you know, just kicked some ideas around and, uh, started dreaming up like a story from start to finish just in my head, right? Like I didn't actually start writing it until about five years ago, but you know, I would, I would think, how would other people react to this particular situation? Or you know, if this was a more remote place, if this was like a flying community, how different would that be for that community too? Uh, and, and that's sort of how it all came together. And, and I wrote it, uh, started writing it in 2015. And then it came out in 2018, so two years ago. And uh, yeah, it, it, it uh, got enough attention that I was able to uh, switch careers. I was able to become a full-time author, which is what I'm doing now. Now I'm working on the sequel. Uh, I just started writing part two to the story. Um, hopefully right. it'll be out in, in late 2022. And uh, you'll see what happens next. I'm ready to your. I'm ready to read your other book. Right on. I'll tell you a little bit about how the next one. So, um, you, you'll know at, at the end of the first one, you know they they move into the bush, right? A couple years later. So we haven't the read the one, end yet. Oh, well, we haven't quite got yet? to the end yet. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's give that part away. But anyway, um, the next part will be about farther into the future. That's all I'll tell you about that. <laughs> How long did it take to write the book? That's a great question. Um, it's uh, for for that one, like, like there's different ways you can think about writing, right? Like, I think thinking is writing too. You know, um, when I was spending all those years thinking about it and not actually writing words down, I think that's part of the writing process as well. So, I would say I started seriously thinking about it, like, and maybe. 2012 uh, for sure started thinking about it like a lot in 2014 and then the actual writing process started in 2015 so um it took me about eight months to write the first draft and keep in mind i was working full-time too right i was working at cbc as a reporter so i would do my writing like either in the evenings or in the early mornings before i had to go to work or on the weekend. So you know, I was just doing it in, in all my spare time, basically. Um, so yeah, it was about eight months for the first draft. And then uh, after that is when I submitted it to the uh, publisher. And they, um, they wanted they wanted to publish it. So then they partnered me with an editor. So when you work with an editor, basically, what they'll do is they'll read the story, and they'll like, suggest edits to make either they'll edit some things or they'll tell you things that you can maybe rewrite or cut out or maybe write more of and so on right so with the editor i worked with her name is susan i think we went back and forth about seven times so she would give me the file she would email it to me and say okay here's what you can work on for this one oh, excuse, excuse me i'd work on it email it back to her and then she'd take another look and then email it back to me and it'd go back and forth like about seven times right and that process took about another i would say a year and a half so uh, it was finally ready in, I would say, early 2018. Uh, and then it was published in late 2018. So I would say, like, from 2014 to 2018 was the whole actual writing process. Um, and it's different. Like, it's different for different people. And, you know, now that I'm writing full time, I don't have another full time job to, to worry about, you know. So I basically spend all my time writing. So I've just started on the next book. Um, hopefully, Hopefully I'll be done a first draft by maybe May or June. Um, that's my goal anyway. So I have to write about 80,000 words. That's how much the first draft has to be. I only got like a couple hundred at this point because I'm just starting. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting because you know, I'm, I'm making up my own writing routine now rather than just doing it on, you know, the evenings or in the weekends, you know? So uh, that's, you know, that's how long the writing process can take if you want to write a book. But, you know, as I said, for everyone, it's different and you do it uh, at your own pace, you know, like you, you do it uh, according to what's comfortable to you and what feels right to you, you know? So that's sort of a glimpse into the writing process, yeah. I have another question for you. Yeah. Is Evan White Sky based on a true story or a real person? Great question. He's sort of like, he's sort of a combination of, of a few different people I know. Um, and, and, uh, I did it that way because I think there are a lot of people and a lot of First Nations who, uh, in a lot of Indigenous communities, not just First Nations, um, who do a lot of good things for the communities, but they don't necessarily uh, do it for any sort of uh, credit or any sort of glory. They just do it because it's the right thing to do. And they want their families to be safe and happy and healthy, and they want the communities to operate well. And they just uh, go about their day-to-day -day tasks to make sure that happens. So that's the kind of guy I wanted Evan Weiss guy to be. Um, because he's like an everyday normal guy from the res and you'd find, I think an Evan White's guy in basically every community, like even yours. I'm sure there are lots of Evan White's guys there. Uh, so I, in that sense too, I wanted to sort of make the central figure like a regular, person, you know, a regular res guy. So what I did was I thought about people in my life, like my friends and my relatives who are like that, who have different skills, like. You know, Evan drives the snowplow on, on the res, and one of my good buddies from home drives the snowplow. And uh, he does a lot of things like Evan does, right? And, you know, another one of my cousins is a good hunter like Evan is. Um, and, and I think Evan also trying to reconnect with his culture, I think a lot of people can relate with that as well. So, you know, I took a, a different elements of different people that I know in real life and just put them all together. And another reason why I did it that way is that I didn't want too many people in my real life uh, to read too much into each character and say, oh, that guy's me for sure, right? You know, because <laughs> that's happened before. You know, one of my cousins will be like, oh, this character's me, right? Like, that's me. And I'll be like, yeah, okay, if you want to see, sure. You know, <laughs> I didn't want, to, didn't want to ruin anything for anybody. Um, but his name, I guess the only thing that really uh, connects him to me is his name. You know, I told you my name is White Sky, Wabagijik is White Sky. So when I was coming up with all the characters, I had all their first names, right? And it's just random, you know, I, I like the name Evan, it sounds cool, so that's why I called them Evan. So I was like, okay, so I'm writing about this community with all these different families. I got to come up with last names too. So I was like, okay, for now I'll just uh, make his last name White Sky. Uh, because my name is Wap Egypt and White Sky, and I'll just leave that for now. But I never got around to changing it. <laughs> so his name stayed White Sky, and it's staying White Sky now for the, uh, well, their family name is staying White Sky now for the next part of the book, too. So, um, yeah, he was, a, he was inspired, but most of my characters are inspired by uh, people who I know on the res and people who I think uh, do great things and should get credit for. It. I think we have time for one last yeah. question. Yeah. Guys, do you have any more questions for Juan? Mm -hmm. Do you have an uncle or an auntie that's younger than you? <laughs> Good question. Um, not, not directly, uh, but I do have... Um, uh, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not in my immediate family, but I think, uh, well, the, okay, I'll, t I'll tell you this, you know, like, um, I have, I just have my first kids now, right? Like, so I'm 41. Uh, our older son's uh, four, so he was born when I was 37. But I have guys my age and cousins my age who are already grandparents, you know, so I started way late compared to those guys, you know, so, <laughs> so it's going to be a while before I'm a grandparent, but they will be great grandparents by the time I'm a grandparent, probably. Um, but that, I'll have to think about it more if I do have aunts or uncles younger than me, but uh, I'll let you know for sure. <laughs> Bob, do you have any advice for any students that may want to become a writer in the future? Any advice for them? Yeah, for sure. I would say just, just write, you know, like, um, just practice it, doing, writing about whatever you think is interesting. 
And it doesn't have to be any length. It could even just be one sentence, you know. Uh, say if you, you go out hunting, you know, you go hunt that beluga. If, when you get back home, you know, write about that. Write about that story. Write about that experience. You know, try to uh, describe um, what it was like out there. Um, describe who you're with. Uh, describe what, you know, what happened and, and sort of how that made you feel. Because I think when you're a writer, basically, um, you want to show people new experiences. You want to show people uh, things that you're not familiar with. You want to teach them about things. But also, you want to make other people connect. Uh, and it's called empathy. The word is called empathy. And that's when you want to make, uh, you want to feel what other people are feeling. Or you want them to feel what you're feeling, right? And that's what um, being, a, I think, an effective writer is, is all about. It's just making people relate with what you're writing about. And uh, I think anybody can be a writer. Um, you don't have to go to journalism school. You don't, you don't have to go to school for English or creative writing. As long as you practice it, uh, you can do it. And I think, like, if, if you're on social media, you know, that's just part of it. You know, writing a Facebook status update, sure, maybe everybody does it. And, but that's part of the writing process. That's part of speaking your own truth. And, and sharing your experience with others. And that's what writing is all about. So I think everybody has it in uh, You just gotta practice it. You just gotta be aware of how you're doing it and and um, what you want to show people. So I think everybody's experience is, is valid and uh, everybody deserves to have their stories out there. And each one of you can be a writer, absolutely. So just, uh, just keep it up um, and keep practicing and uh, eventually, Maybe you'll decide you want to be an author or you want to be a journalist someday. Um, but, but like for me, as I was saying, I never expected to be an author or a journalist. Uh, but here I am because I thought it was interesting to try to write and just to try to share stories. So uh, you all have it. So if that's your dream, keep it up. Uh, well, question because the teacher just requested me to order more of your of Moon of the Crusted Snow for the second semester. Um, I know that you have other books that are, have been published and have been widely read. Um, and maybe Brianne and uh, Ashley and the students would be interested in those. Um, do you a title? Uh, yeah, so my first novel is called Legacy. Um, it's published by Fatus Books. And my first book is a short story collection called Midnight Sweat Lodge. Uh, and it's also published by Fatus Books. Um, yeah, so the Midnight Swell Lodge is basically just uh, short stories about, uh, the, the, there were stories that I wrote when I was a teenager, actually, that I revised later on. And then Legacy is a book about, you know, Legacy is a little heavier. Um, it's about like how uh, the Nishinaabe family uh, tries to heal from tragedy and trauma. But uh, yeah, that was my first novel. So uh, they're like, Thetis is a lot smaller publisher. So the books aren't as widely available, but I think if you got in touch with them, they might have some some copies. Okay, yeah, and and if Ashley and Evelyn would like me to do that, just give me a thumbs up, and I'll get that looked after. Okay, I. See. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Students, do you have maybe one final question? Wow. Like bread, mom. <laughs> How are you? Oh. How am I? Oh, that's a, that's a nice question. I'm great, thanks. Uh, uh, we, we have a little baby, as I said, who was born in June. Uh, that's like the coolest thing. That's the best part of my life right now, along with, you know, his older brother um, and, and my wife. So, you know, the thing about the pandemic is like, we've basically spent a lot of time at home. And, uh, really special for me to have all this time with my wife and my two sons and uh yeah i know it's a hard time for a lot of people but but for me i'm i'm doing great and i'm really excited to be writing this next part of my story and uh hey do you want to come and say hi no okay my my son is coming downstairs now <laughs> he's not ready to say hi um but uh, yeah i'm doing great so thank you very much how, how are you all doing are you all doing okay say hi to your son i will you want to be okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Oh, always a pleasure, and I know that you're going to connect with the other class tomorrow. Hi. Oh, here he is. Hi. 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 Hi.
They're up, they're up, in, they're up in Nunavut. They're up north. <laughs> We're just ending the call now, okay? You see, what do we say in the Shnabe when we say see you later? Bama P. Bama P. Bye. 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 We'll see you tomorrow. Okay, see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah, like I said, you want to press the red button. But, 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 bye. You are the only participant.